That is a common thread. If you are a woman, it's all your fault. Yeah. The vagina plays that devil's magic. It's every time that fucking vagina magic, it'll get you. Badge madge, if you will. (laughs) That is so fucked up. It's fucked up. So fucked up. It is just so damn fucked up. That's fucked up. Because you always look so purdy when we record these days. <laughs> well, it's funny because it, it's just because I've happened to do a couple photo shoots and I always record with I you know. after. Because I never look <laughs> like this on any other days. I know. I kind of miss the high bun. You're like, where's the Ashley who wears the same yellow shirt every day? I am kind of missing your recording robe, I call it. But it's like your sweat. It's a sweater. But... <laughs> I call it your recording robe. It's my all the time robe. And it is a sweater, which is why I feel okay about making it like an all it's the time It's your leader outfit, your recording robe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. And you guys, welcome to our cult. Just, just kidding. What? Maybe. Maybe. Welcome to our recording. This is That's So Fucked Up, a comedy podcast about cults, crime, and other stuff that makes you say, ugh, that's so fucked. Ugh. Yeah. We got a lot of that. Ugh. No never ending material, fortunately and unfortunately. Just the state of the and world is that there's plenty fucked up to talk about. So uh, business is a booming these days. It's, we're never not, we're never going to run out of material. I mean, I would rather that the world just like everything just, became good i don't know you guys let me know if you got the secret sauce and who me i'm one of your hosts we're both your hosts i'm one my name is ashley love richard that sounded so formal and a fallon worry yes hello do you have any great you sounded a little like me in that introduction excuse me my name is my name is ashley ashley love richards so cool my name is fallon newton maury (laughs) <laughs> that is my name, people. And you know what? It's not as cool as love, but hey, we can't all have parents who had the middle name love passed down for like a bunch of generations. It is wild because it was James Love Richards, which is like, if you think about it, James Love Dix. That's like my dad's name and my grandpa's name and many generations before. This is a great segue not loving dicks but like generations and passing things down because what we're talking about today oh my gosh good job i was also i swear i was like we're gonna say the topic right now you guys this is gonna be so fun ready set go what are you talking about today i'm gonna be talking about the amish that's like three and a half minutes in and we announced the topic i'm so proud of us (laughs) dude I'm more proud than I should be (laughs) in this moment. And what, Fallon, what are you talking about? I thought that um, the Amish were just, they're just chilling and riding their buggies and making butter. And I thought it's like all good. They do tours, right? Oh, they do tours. And that's sort of like the image that you get of them from like Uh the public, from their own press, their own brochures or the the brochures that you get if you want to go do an Amish tour. But there's a lot of kind of dark stuff back there. Their way of life is probably fascinating to a lot of people who don't live it because it is so different than what we would call our mainstream life. But then that sort of hides a lot of other stuff that goes on. Well, that's why there's a fucking show on goddamn TLC about the Amish. I think it's called Breaking Amish or something. Because TLC makes fucking shows about any kind of group that's living super differently that we're like, what? The modern day freak show like we talked about. The new F word, you guys. It's fundamentalism. Check it out. It was a presents season. That's so fucked up. Presents. The new F word. Yeah, we talk a little bit about TLC, but this is not TLC. I think that show actually went off the air. This is really real life 
It's a topic that I was originally going to tell you about, but I just kept putting it off for like months. So then you just took it for me, which was nice. Thank you. And that's because trigger warning, child abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse of women and children, animal abuse. There's a lot. Uh, and it doesn't mean uh, that we are saying all Amish people are bad or all Amish sex are bad, but there are a lot of bad things that have happened or do happen. So that's sort of what, what we're referring to. I just kind of stick by my rule of thumb where I think that if there's any kind of group that is pretty secretive and has rules that are punishable by being ostracized from your family or community, I personally can't sign off, which was really interesting because I met somebody recently who was Orthodox Jew and she had eight children and she seemed like a lovely woman Uh, She just was not going to be a good therapeutic fit in my mind because that's such a different life and belief system than me. And I've said before, you know, I was like, because she was so sweet. She was like, yeah, I'm going to listen to your show. I was like, well, I hope if she hears, if she ever hears me say that it's, it's very hard for me to sign off on groups where it, and I think not. Always, but I think very, you know, more often than not, when you put orthodox or fundamentalist in front of X, Y, or Z, things are likely to get maybe too intense by yeah some standards. I mean, I think we can definitely say with Christian fundamentalism, yeah. we've seen, in my opinion, are not great in in like extremism right. is not great. Yeah, and I think the thing with them is we would call them extreme, but they're not they don't consider themselves to be like an extremist branch of something. I don't think they're they just are living this complete way of life. And it's not just a religion. It's actually like an entire lifestyle that they live in. So it's a very unique group to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you about kind of like what the Amish are, because I think there's a ton of misconceptions about them. And then we'll talk about some of the stuff that has come out, especially I think in the last 10 ish years, more and more has come out about them. So you know what I realized the other day? I had been thinking, man, is, is there just more crime and cults and shit now than ever before? And then I realized that I think just AI is better at listening mm-hmm. and giving you than the ever before and, and giving me what I'm fucking looking for. I'm guessing not everybody's news feed is filled with like the latest fucking cult that's been discovered or whatever, you no. know. I was like, oh, I don't think there's more. I just think they're really good at spying. I suddenly have an entire news feed filled with Dear Abby column, like links and Ask Betty. And like, I don't know why, but but I have no idea. But for (laughs) some reason, my Facebook feed like morphed into basically what looks like the world's biggest advice column newspaper so like if it's not my friends it's like an ad for some sort of vibrator which I'm also not out there looking up or talking about every day except with you <laughs> I would be offended because they're like girl you don't know it but you need some advice our advice is to get a vibrator but it's all like advice like just ridiculous situations but I don't know what that happened but I probably engaged with one of them like once, and now they are forever going to haunt my news feed. I wanted to say that if you are listening to us and not driving, don't do this while you're driving, go to tsfuthepodcast.com, click play with us. We're going to do bingo mm. if you would like to join us. The bingo today would obviously, obviously be cult bingo, I think. Obviously. obviously. Yeah, no, I agree. I know. I'm a little tired, I'm going so I'm a there little weird. Right meow. <laughs> what? You're always a little weird. Oh, well, thank you. But that's okay. That's why I love you. I love that your immediate response was, oh, thank you. That's that's great. I said, I'm going right now to a T-S-F-U, the podcast dot com. And then I'm going to go to play with us, which is where I'm going to click bingo and hit cult bingo. But oh my gosh, what else? 
comes up when I'm hovering, play with us. Discord. You guys, join our Discord. Everybody's so nice. It's crazy. The internet is generally sometimes pretty mean and scary, but not our Discord. So join us. Just hit the Discord link. It'll take you right there. One and of us. One of us. One of us. And if you want to become one of us, patreon.com slash TSFU. Also, though, you can find the link to that on the yeah. website. So let's go, Fallon. Give me the give me the haps. Give me the so scoop. So I do have some like good definitions for the things we're going to talk about. So stop me if mention anything but we obviously can't do a super in-depth dive of the entire history of the Amish but let's just kind of boil it down and say that the Amish came to America around the 1700s and they settled in Pennsylvania that's actually where I'm from I'm from like 45 minutes from Amish country originally so which is again why it made more sense for you to tell this story um They were originally a group like so many others escaping religious persecution, especially in Germany and Switzerland. And even though they settled in Pennsylvania, more Amish came and started settling other places like New York, Ohio, uh, and a bunch of Midwestern states, Indiana, Illinois, and some other ones. But the largest settlements of Amish are actually in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. And in the mid-late to late 1800s, some of the Amish citizens or the Amish in these communities started to sort of break off and form a division that was a little more modern. Uh, They wanted to live a more modern lifestyle, but still kind of keep the same like strict tenants in some ways. So this became basically what we know as Mennonites, if you've heard of that terminology. Okay, Mm -mm. so Mennonites are a very similar. Well, I've actually heard of it, but I don't know. Yeah. What it so means. they live a conservative religious life, but they can drive cars. They have cell phones. They go to normal jobs and schools often. Women can work um, as well as men. So I actually had a friend for a long time that was Mennonite. We met in an online mom's forum. And one day she was like, oh, yeah, by the way, because she sent us a picture and we were like, a costume? You're wearing a bonnet? She's like, oh, yeah, I'm Mennonite. We were like, you can have a phone? <laughs> You had no idea. (laughs) She's like, oh, yeah, I'm a Mennonite, by the way. (laughs) So it's it's just like it's uh, Amish. Yeah, kind of. Obviously, you can have friends who are not Amish, hence your friendship. I think they they're hey, no, no harm, no foul. Like you're still you're practicing a religion. That's fucking fine. Yeah. Like. As long as people aren't being abused, which obviously is not something that you can say about a blanket statement about fucking all religion everywhere and stuff. So people being religious is that's great. She sounds like a very nice Mennonite Mm -hmm. woman. Uh, Homegirl cannot talk to you because you're on mission. Guess what? She can't go to school or get a job because her job is to make butter and serve her husband. That's when I'm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's still some of that, but there's more freedom. The the older or the more strict version of Amish is old order Amish, and they still associate with that name today. They are the ones we're primarily going to focus on. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we're not trying to pick at the fucking the parts of the sect that aren't nefarious. Look, there's nothing wrong with taking care of your husband and making butter if that's what you want to do in life. I don't want to. Also, don't want to like shit on that life decision. I just think that when you don't have that decision, that's the only decision that you're presented, yeah. which is, I think, what you're going yeah, to we'll go get into. To that. And you may have heard the Amish do share a common language, typically that is not English. They speak what used to be a form of Pennsylvania German. It is now called Pennsylvania Dutch. It was phased out among all like other people because during World War One, especially, they were sort of trying to remove German influences, I think, from a lot of the U.S. So they sort of suppressed that whole like speaking German thing, but the Amish still speak it. And my friend who was Mennonite okay. spoke it too. That blew my mind. I recently learned that, that um, the Amish are not from Holland. Yeah. Which is where they speak Dutch, right? God, yeah, it's, so it's confusing. definitely a different. Yeah. So because they, uh, I think that's a pretty common misconception because they speak Pennsylvania Dutch. A lot of people like myself thought, oh, okay, so they're from like the Netherlands right. or Holland. Right. 
where that's where they speak Dutch. But no, they're from yes, Germany. It's actually more German based. Fascinating. Yeah. Germany or Crazy. Switzerland um, originally. Oh, but okay. yeah, so and it's funny because, well, no, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. <laughs> Rewind that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I still, you said it was funny and didn't say anything, and I still laughed. I'm like, <laughs> it was funny because I stopped myself. Before like the 1950s, Amish children would attend school with non Amish children. I don't think that really happens. But when American schools in the 50s made this rule that children had to attend school until the 12th grade, Amish started opening their own schools. And some of the children still get to attend public schools, but the actually the Supreme Court of the U.S. ruled at some point, which we'll talk about maybe later, that exempted Amish children from going to school past eighth grade. They want to. The Amish are allowed to be like, nope, pulling them out at eighth grade. They don't have to meet your like federal law. I, You know, it's it's funny because I just have mixed feelings about that because our education system is like very poor. And hey, shout out to teachers. Y'all are doing an awesome job with what you're given, which just the resources that are put towards public education seem. I would say that to be very our lacking. whole education system isn't bad, but I think it is undervalued by lawmakers and people in general. Like yeah. I think that we we way underfund it and we don't give the whole system the resources it needs. So, but these kids don't even get that choice. Like if I'm great at school, my parents can still go, well, you're Amish. So eighth grade and you're done. Like you have to learn how to take care of a family now, which is really right. like kind of sad. Yeah. Is that for yes. boys and girls? Yeah. Kind of everyone. Amish beliefs, they have some sort of I wouldn't say like anti-society beliefs, but they're pacifists. They don't believe in serving in the military when like if there's been times of like a draft, they take civil servant jobs so that they don't have to participate in actual combat. They do believe in obeying laws, but they firmly believe that the law of God should be obeyed over the law of man. And they take that straight from Bible verses. They don't typically use any sort of like public resources. So they don't use life or health insurance. They don't typically collect on like grants social securities. They pay state and federal taxes in most cases, but they don't take any kind of like government assistance or subsidies. So they live sort of totally out of the like public assistance system. But they don't get tax exempt status for being a religion? No. Or is that just individual churches? That's usually individual churches. Yeah, not necessarily. Many... Oh my God. No, I feel like that was really No, it's not a dumb question question at all. (laughs) Because they sort of live their religion. They're not going to church once and then like they are like kind of all together in their religion. But no, it's not a dumb question. Right. They, you know, most of the Amish districts, like they will pull their resources and their funds together in case, you know, you know, John falls off the barn while shingling it and he needs surgery. Like they will pull together and help pay for that as a community versus like having health insurance to cover that. (laughs) Sorry, that sounded like a like a clue. Like John fell off the barn while putting up shingles. <laughs> like Fallon had a candlestick oh. in the dining room. <laughs> I was like, I thought you said like a clue, but yes. No, like clue, the game. Yeah. It's funny because I use that example because when my mom got her house reshingled, she did use like an Amish contractor that came and like shingled her house. Named John. No, I don't think his name was John. Shout out John the <laughs> Shingler. That sounds like a murder name. <laughs> John the Shingler. <laughs> it does sound pretty nefarious. So they, similar to other groups we've talked about, they use kind of that umbrella of authority type structure. I don't know if they call it that, but like God is at the top, then the bishop, then the church leaders, the husband, and then under that, of course, at the bottom is wife and children. Wives and children mm-hmm. have little to no rights. They must They must ask the man in charge of them if they're allowed to even speak. Is it the thing, too, where a man or a male, no matter what age, is the leader in the room? So it could be like a mom and a five-year-old boy. Because, you know, that's definitely the case. And I don't know. I didn't read that specifically. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if once you're a teenager, you get to be more status than your mom if you're like a 13-year-old boy. But I didn't read that about like the children. 
Okay. So they have this concept of like all sins are forgiven no matter what it is. And that greater sin would be not to forgive someone. And that's great for like, if you think about like little things like, oh, how nice and forgiving. But if you think about all of the terrible things that can happen, that um, like forced forgiveness is when someone has no choice and has to forgive. Otherwise, they could even risk losing their home and their family in the Amish community. <laughs> Once someone is forgiven, what we sort of got from the research is that no one is really going to talk about what happened ever again. Yeah, Johnny abused three of his sisters, but they have forgiven him. So we're never going to bring it up again. Nice policy. I don't think forgiveness is always the best policy, to be honest. That's not. Yeah. Maybe it is. Fuck. I don't know. I feel like you're supposed to do it for you, but also sometimes like people just like don't forgive it or sometimes people don't, you know, I don't deserve forgiveness. It's It's okay. Or it's okay to forgive, but you don't have to like talk to that person again or things don't have to return to normal. It also sounds like within this community, forget is required with forgive. Those two go together. Like it can't just be forgive. It's it's forgive and forget. Like shut your mouth. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah. Even my kid who's seven years old, his teacher recently told me that they make the kids at school fill out this like forgiveness sheet and you have to circle in case you're too mad to tell the person like that you were mad at them and it'll be like, I forgive you and it's okay. But they can circle like, I forgive you and it's not okay. And like can tell a kid, I forgive you, but I'm not okay with you and be like really honest. And she was like, the other kids are kind of like, what do you mean? It's not okay. You said you forgive me. And they're like, Sometimes it's okay that it's not okay, which I think is like the coolest thing ever. That is a lesson that <laughs> but like, adults need right. to be learning. Yeah, right. that's great. Apparently that does not translate to large communities like this. Mm-mm. So not here. Contrary to popular belief, Amish can ride in cars, shop at normal stores, use our currency. They don't like trade animals for groceries or anything. Use telephones. If they have jobs outside the community, they can use modern equipment, but they're not allowed to like drive a car themselves. They're not supposed to bring the modern equipment back into their homes with them. My mom has a go in a Walmart that both have horse hitching posts at them in the parking lot. And their Costco is a barn, like a stable. That's and they wild. shop at Costco and pay money. I mean, they can do all of that stuff. So the teenagers in the the community can have jobs outside the community. However, when they earn money, they have to give it all to their fathers and they're not allowed to keep it, meaning they're out there working for no wages. And then lucky them, they get to work for free on the family farm as well. Oh, Bonus. sweet. And they can start to keep their earnings when they get married or when they turn like 21. How lucky for them. When they get married or turn 21 and they probably start working when they're like fucking 12. Or, you know, in Pennsylvania, the you, you can start working with like a special license when you're 15. But like if I was going to be cooking chicken at Boston Market all night, I was keeping that money. Pry it out of my little 15 year old cold hands <laughs> if you need it. <laughs> Get the fuck My away from me. hands. Yeah. So speaking of marriage only, of course, only opposite sexes can get married to each other. They believe sex is sacred between husband and wife, gift from God, all that. Not surprising. It's like they quote this from a Bible scripture that says, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband, which kind of begs the question, like, why is it okay for there to be sexual abuse in secret if it's so pure and holy and virtuous because it's just like you just ask for forgiveness and then it's all good yeah. dog. there is no individualism so the uniform they wear similar dark clothing hairstyles they sort of reject the like modern idea of like pride and differentiating yourself similarly rejecting modern technology because they think that it takes away from the community helping each other and that it like places emphasis on things above god they believe that satan wants them to want things so they can can be happier. Well, Satan's a good guy then. So they deny Satan and his modern materials. Satan just wants you guys to be happy, man. And 
it could be too that modern things could help take like younger Amish away from their communities. Like having a cell phone can allow them to explore the outside world and having a car could get somebody away from an Amish community faster. Knowledge is basically. power. Yeah. And that's why usually in high control groups, they control your media, what you can read, what you can watch, what you can listen right. to. They only want you hearing their fucking specific message on right. loop. Um, and I think that's probably the whole thing about like their daily life, how like children can only go to school until they're in the eighth grade. After that, they're kind of going into whatever trade they'll learn. In 1972 is when the Supreme Court ruled on a case that said due to religious reasons, the kids didn't have to go to school past eighth grade. The Amish kind of fear that if children are given a high school education, they become too smart and possibly make the decision to leave yeah so knowledge is power ergo don't give them any knowledge they'll stay less powerful and we can control a them former amish member named torah bontrager wrote in her blog that the u.s supreme court ruled the amish religion's rights outweigh my individual rights to religious freedom equal protection and adequate education this ruling not only violates children's constitutional rights but it enables and fosters a gamut of child abuse sexual assault runs rampant within the amish children and women don't know they have rights as citizens and most individuals who make the leap to the outside suffer greatly due to lack of culturally competent support. And she was somebody who escaped the Amish life because she wanted to continue her education and was able to get herself legally emancipated from her family due to educational abuse. And then she was, I'm sure, ostracized because you can't leave. Yes. I saw like a clip from Breaking Amish and the mom was like, well, if you leave, don't bother coming back. And it was really sad. So they she she basically sort of summarized. She said a lot and we have a lot of sources that include her blog in the show notes. And it's fascinating. But she said essentially like that case to the Amish were making them concerned about being able to continue to have children work for free, essentially, which reduces the payroll they have to pay other people and keeping people from knowing their constitutional rights because those rights supersede Amish rights. She said, we're forbidden from learning about science, technology, engineering, math, mental health, world history, music, current affairs, law, civics, the arts, and sex education. We don't even have words in our Amish language for vagina and penis. Oh, <gasps> wow. So they're forbidden to know about they what are they uh, just scripture I'm guessing is all Probably. they're allowed to know about scripture and like farming and homemaking. Yeah, so the only thing when they do go to school at their Amish schools they learn are reading, math and bibles. I'm sorry, but I've been <sighs> Dude, it's, it's pretty crazy, actually. I've been learning about the Bible for like a year. <laughs> You're halfway to being Amish. A, no, I'm just kidding. It's a big it is book. It's a big book. We're on numbers. <laughs> it's long, you guys. There's like book and book and books. And I'm going to say, I don't really feel like that counts as like education learn bible stories no. like i know some lessons now and i know some more stories and like i get the gist of some stuff you know but it doesn't replace the subjects that no, i took in school but you that... would be surprised at the mental gymnastics that religious groups make you play about the bible being an academic resource like i started a degree I started a degree program <laughs> at a college that is Ugh. right by my house. And it's a pretty famous Christian college started by a Pat Robertson. And this was for a PhD. And the course I took, they made us write a whole paper on why the Bible could be considered a scientific research source, why it was like scientifically valid, why it was a good basis for scientific research. And you had to like do a paper to talk about why you could show Show that it was basically like the answer was like Jesus said so it like it was like a self licking ice cream cone like this is pretty oh typical God. of how long did you stay at that school two semesters and then I was like I can't do it so the email I sent to them was like I prayed a lot about it and I don't think it's right for me at this time <laughs> y'all there is something, there is on, something my heart. on my heart I have heart. to share with you <laughs> I've prayed. Yeah. Luckily, he forgave me. So, I mean, we're good, <laughs> him and I. We're all set. Um, so I hope you and I are as well. Yeah. <laughs> Deuces. Yeah. Bye. Fallon. So 
the boys, the Amish boys don't even always get a choice in the trade that they learn once they leave eighth grade. Girls never have a choice. Some women are allowed to be school teachers and midwives, um, school teachers at Amish schools, of course. I'm sure that an eighth grade education might be what's required for that. Some districts... Uh, Amish districts, women can work in local towns, restaurants, retail stores, but they still have to come home and manage the entire household. So like, it's not like they're like husband and them share responsibility if they work. And most... Right. That's just an extra thing that they get to do to get out and of And similar house. to like what we've heard before in fundamentalist sex, most girls help with child rearing of their younger siblings, cooking, cleaning, and basically from birth learning how to be a wife. Which leads to what is it called perennification perennification yeah. trauma where children don't get to experience a childhood of their own because they're given the responsibility to take care of their younger siblings this is something that happens a lot in fundamentalist sex and it's generally pretty traumatizing for the older right. siblings. and they're supposed to have many children <laughs> The people who have the most children are considered church leaders. So a lot of what we see in other groups, it's not different mm -hmm. for them. A district's bishop can decide if a family is allowed to stop having children due to health concerns. It's always great when some random dude gets to tell you you should continue to bear children even if you're unwell to do so. So this is they have like the quiverful attitude, the get as many babies as you can they're not looking to send them out in the world because they're probably because they're propagating the continuation of the Amish community, right? We need more okay. people in the Amish faith to continue the Amish community, I would imagine. Okay. Whereas in like fundamentalist Christianity, at least in certain sects, particularly the Quiverful sect, they're all about having as many babies as possible so that you can train those babies to be good fundamentalist Christians and then go get into politics and yeah. get them to overturn abortion rights, etc. Right. Exactly. So there is something called the Ordnung, and that's the rules for each Amish community. And these can actually vary from community to community. Some can be very strict. Some can be just like a little bit looser. It'll tell them like in this community, you can use a gas powered lawnmower and not a push lawnmower or all women's dresses are purple or they're all blue or whatever. So this this is like what sets the rules in each different community for the Amish and kind of what the families do is totally dictated by these these rules, this ordnung. So it'll say like families in this community have to be farmers or you can own a business or you can go work in the community. And it turns out in many communities like the Amish have to go work at outside places because they can't use modern farm tools. So they can't keep up with big factory farms that are producing milk and eggs. Wait, how is that better to go get a real job than to just get a fucking Cow milker, electric? Right? Yeah. I feel like there's like to step into their shoes, like two evils mm -hmm. here. And I feel like getting electric farm equipment is not as bad as like sending people out into the world where they could be exposed to things, yeah. you know? Yeah. And like my mom, you know, even in recent years, once a week, whenever I'd visit my mom, we'd always go up to the farmer's market. We'd typically get meat and eggs and milk from meat and eggs, usually from like an Amish butcher or an Amish uh, food stand. We go to a lot of Amish bakeries in the town she lives in. There's like Amish furniture stores and cell phone businesses everywhere that they work at. They make furniture and sell it. So they do have businesses in the community. I think I have some decorations in my house from cell phone businesses, but they're Self not like, owned. they're like, and <laughs> oh my God, dude, I was like, that's 
super random since that's not really their jam. Yeah, self-owned. Like, you Sorry. know, they, se- they sell phones <laughs> and furniture. Amos okay. is in the back alternately, like, piecing together benches and then doing microcircuitry in the back of a Nokia. Like, to he's, like he's like, okay, I've, I fixed the new, um, I fixed this apple. <laughs> Bring the next one back here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh Enunciation would be helpful. Self-owned. <laughs> Cell phone. So, You talked about Amish tourism. The biggest and most popular tourist spot is in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. They get 8 million visitors a year to Amish country. There are lots of restaurants. Like I said, my mom lives kind of nearish to here and there are a lot of restaurants and businesses there owned by the Amish. It's like a five up to a five billion dollar business nationwide. Essentially, like in some cases, they've turned like their beliefs and their way of life into a brand. Um, that doesn't seem very traditional. Yeah. So they, if you go to an Amish, like I've been to one, like an Amish tour, they'll take you in. They might take you into a front room of a house. It's not really being used by a family currently or into the front room of a schoolhouse. They'll tell you a little bit about the Amish. Then they'll like make sure that there's baked goods and quilts and furniture out on display for you to buy. And sometimes you get to tour little like areas of their community. But are these the more Mennonite communities or like the not chill ones where people are getting abused and controlled? I think both. They're in the area near where my mom is. The mix of people who work in stores is probably like, I I think I see more Mennonite women working in the stores, but there's both. How can you tell the difference? Do they wear different clothes? Yeah, they wear different clothes. Typically, and I think Mennonite communities all have different rules, but typically what I see Mennonite women are either in like long dresses that are not super obviously like tight or they they're allowed to wear like long skirts, like similar to like the fundamentalist people that we talked about, like long skirts, hoodie mm-hmm. sweatshirts. Mennonite women don't always wear like a full bonnet. I don't think they can sometimes can wear just like a little head covering, but typically they have on a bonnet, even if they're in like a jean skirt and top. Amish usually Mm -hmm. have like a very prescriptive outfit, like all little girls. You've probably seen pictures of them. Like the little girls are in like a purple dress with a black apron or a black bonnet. Often like I think the color of their clothes and what they wear like signifies what stage of their life they're in. Oh, interesting. For some reason, I just imagined it all black and white, but obviously that's not No, they have like different (laughs) color clothes. A lot of ex-Amish people have said that because the Amish tourism brings such massive amounts of money into certain states and like certain counties within these states, that might be why you see Amish perpetrators getting sentenced so lightly. They receive notoriously light sentences compared to non-Amish with the same crimes. Wait, why? Because they have people. There's suspicion. No, there's suspicion that because they bring in so much money and tourism dollars to, like, let's say Lancaster, Pennsylvania, like Lancaster County has a bunch of like these little tiny villages and towns in it. It's not. It's not very big. Like some towns that you see in Pennsylvania have like one street this way and one street this way. That's the whole Mm -hmm. town proper in some residential area, and like bringing in eight million dollars a year what happens if like eight million dollars a year in tourism money dries up because everybody heard that some guy in the amish village got sentenced for murder or rape or something so that's like a suspicion it's not proven but because they are known though for getting lighter sentences and we're gonna start talking about a little bit of the abuse here and you're gonna see kind of like what knew that was coming We're going, I'm going to give a big trigger warning here for animal abuse, animal cruelty. I'm not going to go into deep detail, but this is something they're known for in general. If you want to fast forward, especially if you're a dog lover, I would say two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, Ooh. I'll try to be oh. better. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, I'm ready. As I mentioned, Ohio is one of the states with the biggest Amish populations. They actually, I believe, now outnumber the other states, including Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for the most 
Amish people in the state. Holmes mm-hmm. County, Ohio has one of the largest Amish populations in Ohio, and they have the most puppy mill- mills per square mile. They use commercial breedings for dogs because to them, dogs are like livestock and more of a source of money. So they're not thinking of them as beloved family pets. It's just let's churn them out. So a lot of the things you hear about puppy mills, making one dog have puppies for her whole life and then just till they're really sick. Many of the dogs in their mills develop a ton of illnesses, bad teeth, cancers. Often they sleep in tiny cages. They're not treated. The AKC, the American Kennel Club, does regulate puppy mills, but their standards are kind of low. And it's hard to surprisingly hard to shut down a puppy mill. They have to be typically really, really bad to get closed down. You guys don't buy from breeders. Please rescue. There's so many, so many dogs and baby for babies that need homes. Yeah. So there's a list of breeders, like bad breeders put out every year by the Humane Society called the Horrible Hundred. And every year there are multiple Amish commercial breeding farms on that list because they're a bad perpetrator of that. There's a there's three puppy mills on the list, for example, in Ohio that are all owned by the same family and they make over six figures a year breeding dogs because they found that that's easier than farming. So that's like their primary occupation. And they just don't give a single shit about the dogs. They're just dollars. Exactly. They're just units of a product like any other business. Ugh. Yeah, they they don't have safe spaces for them. Ohio, that county in Ohio had 30 out of 100 of the worst places for dogs um, in 2023. Jesus, fuck. And if you're not, if you're out there going, okay, well, I bought from a pet store and it's okay because I didn't get from an Amish breeder, their puppies are sold both online and to pet stores. So you could be getting a pet store puppy from an Amish puppy mill, especially a pure breed puppy. If you are buying from an online pet store, you are probably buying from a puppy mill. Dude, and trust me, I want a fucking, what's that cute one? Frenchie? Mm-hmm. Is a French French bulldog? Yeah. And they're all like the gray one with the blue eyes. That's like my dream dog. But unless I get super duper lucky finding one, like I probably won't get one. But there, and a lot of inbreeding goes on at these places as well, right? So it just, yeah, it ends up with the puppies who are born being really not healthy. That's all we're going to talk about with the animals. So if you were skipping ahead, now we're going to talk about crimes against other people. Hey guys, we're back. We're um, back. Still gonna be a bummer, but it just won't be um, about our four-legged yeah, friends. Yeah, and I'll I'll <laughs> give the appropriate trigger warning before we get to that place. Some of what I'm about to talk about is sort of some summarized notes from a documentary on Peacock called Sins of the Amish. If you haven't seen it. Mm. It's a tough Mm -mm. watch. So essentially, we're not going to summarize it in detail, but we are going to go through some points from it. Going to the police is the worst sin that you can make as an Amish person. And that is something we talked about earlier, like not forgiving a person, right? Are we talking blanket Amish or just the more fundamental communities? More of the fundamental communities. I I mean... It's just when you cannot go to outside authorities um, in Jehovah's Witness and in Mormonism to name a very few, like you're supposed to go to like church elders or whatever, which is always like some old ass white dude who's definitely going to victim blame the person. That is like such a huge red flag in a group where you're not allowed to yeah. go to outside oh, yeah, help. For sure. Like that's fucked. From this documentary, and there are actually like some mixed reviews on it online, so you can watch it yourself and make a decision, but it does cover both to an extent, so Amish and Mennonite, because there is still a lot of abuse that goes on in the Mennonite communities as well. Basically, as we talked about, they expect everybody to forgive all wrongs, and that includes things like, oh, can I say these words? (laughs) Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and give the trigger warning right up front. This includes sexual assault, incest, beatings, etc. If someone goes to the police, they might get shunned by their community, and that means they won't be allowed to go to church or community events. It doesn't necessarily mean you get kicked out of the community, but it might mean that you're sort of like ostracized from all activities within the community. 
Which is really harmful when you haven't had any fucking education and you don't know anything about the outside world. Right. And you don't know what your rights are. If you've always lived this life, you don't know that outside it's different. You don't have a TV. You don't have a radio. You don't go to a school with other people. How would you know? Many times local police won't necessarily get involved because of the whole, well, freedom to practice your own religion nonsense. It can sometimes be hard to get police involved. There's got to be some fucking boundaries there, man, that can't cut and dry. That's how so many of the troubled teen industry facilities operate is they'll be running under some sort of religious affiliation like Circle of Hope Girls Ranch was an independent fundamentalist Baptist boarding school. And there was no fucking government regulations because you're like, well, you guys are religious, so you get to do whatever the fuck you want. No. Yeah. The church does. It's like the whole concept, like you said, of of other extreme religions like the church will say okay we'll punish the person that committed this sin but that might mean okay we're shunning them for some period of time but then after some time we'll decide that they've like fully been punished enough yeah you're more likely to get like ostracized for standing up for yourself for being abused than you are for actually abusing someone i love that i love that for victims and perpetrators in some cases the victim or the perpetrator may be kicked out of the church altogether or excommunicated if a girl or a woman is sexually assaulted or molested or abused they are only supposed to talk to the bishop of their district who is a man Mm -hmm. and sometimes Mm -hmm. that person might be one of their own family members because many many people are related they have enormous families so you could be talking to like uncle steve who's the bishop of your district about the sexual abuse that just happened to you which I'm sure really encourages people to come out and talk well, about Well, then the bishop of the district will go to other leaders in the church, so other people with lots and lots of kids in the church, I guess, and decide how seriously they want to take your accusation. They also get to decide on that. Many times, if they believe the perpetrator to be a good, upstanding member of the community, they won't believe the women, of course. What a shock. The- what? That never happens. The girls or the women still have to face their abusers every day. And so there's no protection from them. Like nobody is going to go in and keep them apart. I just like, I can't just like, I just size. That's all I have for you. If girls try to tell other people in the community, they'll potentially be labeled as like, they're crazy. They're menstruating. They're not following what God wants for them to do. Of course. They're menstruating. Or even worse, sent off to an institution to be reprogrammed back into the Amish way of thinking. So I guess even the Amish has their own little version of the TTI. Dude, the more I learn about the troubled teen industry, the more I find out it just like has its fucking tentacles. Just so many. And the saddest thing is that oftentimes like mothers can't help their children because they face fear of retribution from their husbands or the rest of the church, Um, especially if they're in a situation where like their husband is abusive. Right. And it's really want to remind people of something about domestic abuse. I feel like a lot of times it's like, well, why don't they leave? People who are in domestic abuse relationships are statistically in the most danger when they do leave. I feel like people really need to fucking understand Mm -hmm. that it's not just this. Why didn't they leave? If they stay yeah, they're going to keep being abused. If they leave, they might fucking die because that's when the s- person people act d- out. Snap. Right. Yeah. So I'm real tired of the I have been for a long time and I'm talking about it with less rage right now, probably because it's evening. But just like I'm tired of that narrative of well, why didn't they leave? Right. Especially if you're having been in a like not physically but abusive relationship i wasn't afraid for my physical safety but it is still really hard to escape a person that has spent five or six years manipulating you and grooming you and if you've been manipulated your whole life into thinking that you 
have zero rights and that you are able to be physically or emotionally punished for anything you do, like an Amish woman, of course, you're not going to just jump up and leave. Right. It's it's learned. Um, what is it called? Learned, learned helplessness. I think to yes. a degree. We learned so much during the um, psychotic psychology season, but you kind of just stop trying to or you'd never do in the first place. Try to stand up for yourself because you know that it's not going to help your cause. Right. If you're getting abused on the best of days when you've done nothing wrong, what do you think is going to happen to you when you stand up against that same system? At some point, you're just not going to try. So I I just want to like, I, I watched this movie um not that long ago and oh boy, I did not know what I was getting myself into. One of yeah. those It was based on the true story of eight confirmed, probably more. Mennonite men, they were in an insular colony in Bolivia because we we're talking mm-hmm. about Mennonite versus more traditional or so fucked. So they had been, it had been this like long time thing of these men drugging, like sneaking into people's houses at night, drugging women with, I think, like cow tranquilizer or some shit it happened to over a hundred women know. like this group of men it was over several years you've you told me about it oh my god dude the movie women talking you guys it's really really good it's based on the story it's really good but it's really intense it's, it's fucking insane i just so it's like yeah not not all communities not all mennonites not all amish right was we, right. we know hopefully you guys understand by now um if you've been listening for a while that like we're definitely not Mm -mm. trying to make blanket statements about like any groups except for like scientology or you know (laughs) shit like that like no it's that's all bad they're all bad (laughs) but you know like in this particular mennonite community the women weren't saying anything because like nothing was being done because they didn't really think it was wrong because it's such a part of life yeah, like I don't want to go too far into it because I I was looking into it like a couple years ago when I watched the movie, but it was just like it was mass serial rapes happening by multiple men over a course of several years. I don't know. I just feel like you can't tell me that there wasn't a way to catch them sooner or that people didn't fucking know who these dudes were. It's just... And and I think that's something, you know, that is really just a pretty common thread yeah. is the sexual abuse going on in oh, these yeah. communities. Well, and also where I was going to go next is that sex education for them often doesn't start until they're about 11 or 12, which is fine. Like some people don't educate do sex education till then either but it's usually like a very vague handbook about male parts and female parts but not for the other gender like if you're female you're getting a little handbook about female parts and if you're getting mm-hmm. a if you're a guy you're getting the one about male parts you're not like learning what the opposite sex has even though you are going to encounter them if their family design works out for you right like right. so let's not keep it a secret it doesn't talk about they don't get taught necessarily about about how like babies are made. Many Amish women don't understand that and have no idea about sex. And then on their wedding nights, they are often like forced to have sex because that's what's expected of them. And we've heard that in other religions as well, because sadly it is not limited to one group. Nope. Marital rape is um super accepted. Yeah. And not every person experiences it, but it does happen. Something that was brought up was like if a single young girl is sexually assaulted and gets pregnant, they often just try to marry her off quickly. So then the husband, the person she marries, looks like the father of her baby. So nice of them. Oh, well, she doesn't have to marry the rapist? No, not necessarily. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's nice. Because I know sometimes in some cultures, that that's a fun one. They have to marry their rapist so that they don't look like a whore. Right. God, they're at least not doing that here. And I think like some mothers in the Amish community might be a little more liberal and try to teach their daughters about these things. But most don't just because that's just not how it's done. Of course, the sex education handbook 
does talk about the sexual drive of all men because we want to make sure that everyone understands that. Even the girls. Right. Yeah. So like even if it's their brother or their father or another family member, the girls have to know that it's all their fault if men become aroused. Do you know why it's the incestual sex abuse is so rampant in some of these communities? I would imagine it's because they're so insulated. If you... Yeah, there's not really other people around so much. Think about it. If you live in a community that's got 500 people, probably you're at some point, because the families are so large and they're formed out of like giant family clusters, like you're probably related at least as like a cousin to a fifth of the people in that community. Like you probably can't escape it. Yeah. It just seems like within the households, like the brothers... I don't know. Maybe because it's like because this pervasive culture of like, well, we could always we want to explore sexually. And I guess we could always blame it on our sister for arousing us. I don't know that for sure, because I'm not. Uh, Yeah. No, I mean, I'm interested to understand that if there is any understanding to be had. Girls are trained to remember to be modest. Don't wear their night clothes around their dads or brothers because you should have to worry about your dad or your brother becoming aroused. Don't show any skin. Don't make any moves like don't climb on a ladder when there's a boy underneath. So that's basically, okay, and that again brings me back to like Institute of Basic Life Principles, IBLP, Christian Fundamental stuff where it's like, oh, well, it's your fault if you aroused the man. Yes. And then here they're saying, hey, be careful around your brother and your dad so you don't arouse them, which is also teaching dad and brother, hey, it's natural for me to get aroused by my daughter or sister. That's a weird fucked up teaching from the boys beginning. Boys are taught that their sexual desires, I think boys and girls are taught that boys sexual desires just awaken at a certain age, but it's not their fault. So like whatever those are, it's not, they're not responsible for them. So of course it's all like on the woman in an Amish marriage. So as they get older, they obviously are expected to marry. And in an Amish marriage, it is incredibly restricted and controlled. Often wives have to ask their husband's permission before they can speak their opinion on a certain thing. I don't know if it means like speaking ever, but in certain situations, they have to ask permission to speak. If a wife tries to speak out against abuse or sexual assault to her bishop, she will likely be told, like, you're just not doing a good enough job submitting to your husband. The stage is set, like, early on for marital rape is your fault. She'll be told that she needs to do better for God. And if her husband is mad at her, that she's not following his rules and should try harder. If you have a vagina, it's your fault. What's my fault? Fucking everything. everything. Right. Which kind of stems from the Bible, if you think about it. Well, that's how they kind of get away with it. Bunch of hot bullshit, but whatever. I'm actually (laughs) doing the opposite of you. I've been watching this YouTube series called A Secular Bible Study, and it's like a guy who's got a master's in theology breaking down the Bible and like how much bullshit some of it is and how awful it is. Like, it's amazing. So if you want to hear the Bible for dummies, listen to Ash Learns the Bible. And if you want to hear it talked about in a smart way, listen to that. Well, it's guy. a guy who was a Christian and went to, I guess, like divinity school. And now he's an atheist. And so he goes back with like an educated eye and like deconstructs a lot of what's in there. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. But that is a common thread. If you are a woman, it's all your fault. Yeah. The vagina plays God that devil's it. magic. It's every time that fucking vagina magic, it'll get you. Vag Madge, if you will. <laughs> I make a cream for that, I hear. Uh, Vag Madge, available at Walgreens. your local Walgreens <laughs> and Target, because we're bougie. I don't like that name for anything. <laughs> you guys, reach out if you want me to make a shirt that says Vag I need it like a fake 60s looking cream, like a toothpaste tube. Vag Madge yeah. with like little sparkles <laughs> behind it. <laughs> and then a little flower to That's know. what I'm wearing to your convention. Wink, wink. That's what I'm wearing. You guys, 
mid July, we're going to be at the True Crime Podcast and Paranormal Podcast Convention in Denver. Go to truecrimepodcastfestival.com to buy tickets and you can come meet me and Fallon. What? what? And like a bunch of other cool people, but me and Fallon. That's it. Sorry, that was our levity break back to the depressing uh, show so the bishops of the community will jump in if the abuse is bad enough oh bad enough oh that's nice wonder what constitutes that near death probably divorce is never an option some amish couples have divorced but it's typically far worse for the wife and she can just have her children taken from her because everything is the man's property so even though she's been raising them they can all be taken from her as we said many women like actually experience you know marital rape on their wedding night because they don't understand what sex and consent are and i doubt the rules of consent really are held up in many of these situations i doubt they're even ever consent the taught the word consent they're not turd turd <laughs> they're not told any word for fucking vagina or penis right. like i'm sure there's no word for consent what's consent Tell me if this sounds familiar. Women are supposed to be ready for the man whenever they want it or not. Men need release every 72 hours. Oh, Christian fundamentalism. It's written in a book, you guys. And apparently it's written in theirs too. Or it's an implicit rule. If a wife goes to the police, she could face being excommunicated and having her children taken away. Of course, women in the Amish community aren't necessarily told about court procedures or the fact that, you know, abuse advocates out there could help them. They are basically lied to and told them it's a worse sin to go to authorities. They've been told their whole life that the English, which is their word for non-Amish citizens that mm -hmm. the English have no morals and won't help them. So many of them are afraid that English resources um, of turning to English resources for help because like only God can help them. Tale as old as time, only God can help. And of course, they the Bible verse used to justify this is the same one we've heard before. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So that same kind of concept many Amish and Mennonites use to train up a child by our friends Michael and Debbie Pearl. Oh, well, they should just fucking hang out with the, the IBLP. IBLP crew. They're just two peas in a pod. You know, the sad thing is, like we've heard before, parents are taught to break their children between one and four years old. And very often, tourists will tell Amish parents how well behaved their children are. Not knowing, of course, the abuse that's happening behind them. Well, it's like the Duggars, you know? It's like, oh my God, look at how amazing these kids are. 17, 18, 38 of them just acting like perfect angels. It's like, yeah, well, not because that's how kids generally just normally act. So I'm going to say this next section, and we're actually getting close to the end but this next, next section is going to deal with potential child or young person sexual abuse so if you want to trigger warning fast forward but it happens most frequently among children and their family members as they are the people who have closest access to them Ugh. which is what you asked before the kids often have no one to turn to because people either don't believe them because they're just kids or nobody will do anything about it and in the whole spirit of everyone has to be forgiven, if an Amish person is called before the congregation to confess this sin, they're supposed to be forgiven once they confess. They don't have to change their ways once they confess. Let's make that distinction. They just have to be what? forgiven by the victim and the congregation. Nobody puts like a watch on them and says you have to. So you just have to be like, sorry, and then you're free to do it again and then just apologize again and you're good. Yeah, and, and they don't like force the child and victim to be separated. So often the child has to be interacting with their victim over and or their perpetrator over and over again. And so abuse can obviously continue happening. So it's just very fucking built in yeah. to their systems. The worst part is that victims are not allowed to bring up the incident any longer. Like once it's been brought up once, I guess, like that's that. And they have to forgive no matter what. Um, 
And an article that we used for this episode called Network of Care said that the Amish believe fervently in the need to forgive those who have wronged them. But this tradition of radical forgiveness places the onus on victims of sexual abuse and assault to move on and bury their trauma. Sometimes they do make a perpetrator go to a type of like Bible based counseling that's either with church ministers or a facility that treats what they call themselves as plain. They are the plain, so plain folk, so Amish or Mennonites. There's a facility in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania called Whispering Hope. I did not know this. They accept violent offenders that don't have to stay in jail for one reason or another. It's not a state licensed facility. No one holds them accountable. There are no licensed therapists or psychologists and the recovery is based on Bible teaching and repentance. No one under 18 years old is allowed on the property and wives can come live with their husbands in a small cottage located on the property and become part of their recovery. That's run by the Amish Amish for the Amish who have been like perpetrators of abuse. But for one reason or the other, the court's like, yeah, you're not eligible for our jail. So they're like. It's okay. We'll rehabilitate you. Good. The facility claims it's a Christian home with a Bible-based counseling program for men who are emotionally disturbed, depressed, having spiritual and marital problems, moral obsessions, and mental illnesses. Moral obsessions being a really, really nice way of saying they like to assault children and young people in their community. There are no fences to keep the perpetrators in. They're not supposed to leave, but nothing's stopping them. I wouldn't want to live a couple miles from that place. Typically, if there is an incident, um, it's not reported. But in general, it's not reported to police or anyone of authority by the bishop. So once you tell the bishop, like, that secret stops with him, you're, he's not going to the police and being like, come on over, something bad has happened. Sometimes, as we've mentioned, the kid's mom will try to help them, but often they feel like they can't and they're not listened to anyway. If it is like the father or another close fam family member who's the perpetrator, the victims and the mother are not usually listened to because they are considered his like property. They don't take the allegations seriously. It's just no protection anywhere for them at all. No. Mary Byler, they use the pronouns they them. So you'll hear me refer to them as they them. They said that from adolescence, they were taught that it was their responsibility to make sure that they didn't do anything that would entice a boy or man into sexually abusing them. They said that they were never really taught how babies were made, but it was up to them to make sure they never got pregnant before marriage and to stop boys from raping them. And then all of a sudden you get pregnant and you're like, oh, what's this fucking alien thing in my body? Right. Their story is really, really sad. One of the worst cases of injustice in these communities. They were um, sexually abused by their biological father, several of their brothers, stepdad, and a few cousins from the ages of 5 to 17. What the and fuck? And in this case, they did end up in regular court with their abuser to their brother, Johnny. And they said, you raped me so many times, I cannot count them all from the time I was eight. And as far as I can remember until I was 14, you raped me. Most happened at their house or on family property. And when they would lock themselves in their room, their brother would come in through the window or take the hinges off the door. Oh my fucking, dude, that's a goddamn horror movie. So we're going to be speaking with Mary soon, hopefully, and getting their story if they choose to share it or just talking about whatever they want to talk about while they're here. But if you want to see more about their story, it is available as part, I believe, of the documentary Sins of the Amish. Yeah. And, you know, just because we are going to be Speaking personally with this person, obviously their story is out there, but we'd like to give them a chance to go into as much detail as they feel comfortable with. So we're not going to really go further into detail on their story, but look out for that interview, you guys, because we really um, obviously at TSFU believe in giving survivors and victims a platform if they want to, can have their voice heard and tell their story in the way that they want it to be told. So I'm looking forward to that. Yes, definitely. And 
I will say, though, that in this case, they were able to report it to police, which uh, who worked with them to build a case, which doesn't happen, as we've heard. And there were numerous family members arrested and brought to court. Their mother was brought up on charges of not reporting a crime and got a a stayed jail sentence and two years probation. Their stepfather got six months in jail, but the sentence was stayed. And their brothers all got various um, lengths of jail sentences for their for pleading guilty to their charges. Eight years in prison, four years in prison. It's kind of a whole case of complete injustice. And if you listen to our episode, I don't know, maybe last week about Quiet on Set, where we talked about how, is it Drake Bell, right? We yeah. talked about how Drake Bell went to court against his abuser and the whole side of the courtroom was full of his abuser's supporters and he had like one person. Same thing happened here during their brother's trial. The entire courtroom was filled with members of the Amish community to support the perpetrator. Many letters of support sent to the judge, like about 150 Amish attended the trial to support the perpetrator. Not a single person was in the room to support Mary, the actual victim. Oh, my God. Um, their attorney and a court-appointed advocate were absolutely appalled at the this tactic. It was like a big intimidation tactic. <laughs> They stood up and used their voice and read an impact statement in front of all those people. So good to them. Now they are an advocate for Amish and Mennonite sexual assault victims. And I'm really hoping we get to talk to them because they sound awesome. Um, By the way, that Nickelodeon episode was five weeks ago. Man, time flies. Oh, five weeks ago. We're in the past. Ooh, where are we? Speaking about the future. So the good thing now is that you know, there's so much we could cover here and we've talked for a while. There's a lot about the Amish that I did not cover. There's a lot of nuances to their way of life and their religion. There's tons of resources out there you can watch because it is not necessarily all bad. Like their way of life is different. There's also so much that is covered up and you can also find a also, lot on that. this show isn't called That's So Nuanced. Right. You know, we get it. There's, I mean, we don't, we need to be reminded life is nuanced. It's very gray. It's not all black and white, not all Amish, not all fucking cops, not all. Yeah, we get it. Yeah. Obviously not all Christians. Yes. But what we are here to do is highlight the, the fucked upness. Like you listener, are you, are you like planning on joining an Amish community anytime soon? Probably not. But are you maybe going to reconsider buying a puppy online? Or fucking giving them your money to take a tour to compliment their well-behaved children. You know, it's just just about, you know, it's it's not about saying everybody everywhere is the worst. Right. It's about saying over here and over here, this is not great. And maybe you don't want to support it. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm not speaking in absolutes, but there are some good things that are starting to happen. So local Lancaster County police in Pennsylvania say they're starting to get more cooperation from the Amish and Mennonite communities. There's actually a council of Amish and Mennonites that was made specifically to make reporting abuses easier. And they work directly with the police and report abuses that are confessed to them, which is great strides. Okay. Um, yeah. Local police reported that they believe the communication between them and the plain communities, so Amish and Mennonite, is stronger and that more abuses actually are now being reported than ever before. Well, that is very good. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. I feel like we'd be uh, remiss, is that the word maybe, to not like uh, explain what rumspringa is. Yeah. So uh, there's so many things that I know have been out in the popular culture. So rumspringa is a cultural tradition that begins after Amish kids turn 16 years old, and they can actually choose to live as Amish for a period of time. And this could be... Non um, non Amish for a period of time. Sorry, uh -huh. it's late and I'm tired. I know it is late. <laughs> I don't know why I talked in that accent. I've never. <laughs> it can last for a few months or a few years. Teenagers could be out of the Amish community for years and still decide to come back. So men and women. Yes. Correct? 
So I do, I, I just thought that would, was good to mention while we were saying it's not all bad everywhere and stuff, because it does sound like, uh, despite everything else, they do get an opportunity at a point to go and make a decision. Although if they make a decision not to come back, that also means ostracized, right? Right. The districts that they live in and the ordinance rules we've talked about, like the rules of the districts, the ordining, the rules for like what the rum springer can be actually are given to them. So some of them might have more strict rules like you can do these things when you're out you can't do these things when you're out but in general you can live life as a english person so a non-amish or non-mennonite person most of them come back to become baptized in the amish church at the end and once they're baptized they settle down and start a family so i do find that really interesting because i feel like that's not something you see in a lot of other high control groups where they're like, hey, why don't you take this time by yourself to explore other options? Right. That's that's very that's very interesting. But I feel like it's kind of a smart move on their part, because if they spend their whole lives saying like the English world doesn't have support for you, the English world is crazy, the English world is wild. And then you get out there and you realize where you've had sort of this community there giving you what you need your whole life. You get out there and you have have nothing. You've come from an Amish community. You don't know how to work at maybe an outside job. You have never lived in an apartment. You've never seen a TV. So maybe a lot of them go back because it's easy. Right. Like, wow, everything they've told me my whole life is totally right. It is wild out there. I get no support. People are People mean. People are mean. Because they are. Right. <laughs> like nobody takes care of each other. Like I'm sure that some of that occurs. Some districts, mm-hmm. though, don't allow it. Some districts will say, okay, you can't go live on your own for Rumspringa, but we will throw you bonfires on the weekends or like other events. Some people don't get the free hot American Amish summer or whatever. Wet hot (laughs) Amish summer. Yes, wet hot (laughs) Amish summer. Oh my God. Right. Well, fuck, man. Good job. That was a lot. I felt like I was racing through it because there's just so much to tell. But a lot of it is like the stuff we've heard from other religions. So I was even surprised looking into this topic. Wow, this crosses over lots of spots. Would somebody just stop printing to train up a child for the love of God? Oh, my God. Stop it. No, it just blew my mind because for the longest time, and I think me and a lot of other people, I just had the impression that like the Amish were super chill and they just, hey, you guys, we're more into candles and electricity and we're fucking, we're cool with horses. And I was like, that's cool, man. And then I started hearing about all of these abuses and I was like, that's not cool, man. Yeah. That was real as fuck. Real. Real fucked up. Two in a row. (laughs) Well, two in a row for us us recording. Remember, it's back to the future. Right. You guys, we we, we recorded Nickelodeon and Amish this week, so it was just like child abuse central. I will say we have some amazing resources in the show notes, and there's the documentary. So if you are like, ooh, I want to learn more about this please check out our resources. Our researcher did an amazing job putting this together. Sup, Peggy? Um, yeah. So there's more detail than, than Fallon knew than what I know to what to do, do with. with. But uh, yeah, it's, it's there for your reading pleasure if you need it. Just wallow in the misery we've brought you. But next week, it's going <gasps> to be better. Also, you guys, next week, if you're like, oh my God, what is the new present season going to be about? I have a hint. It's going to be about the worst place on the internet slash downfall of society. Any guesses, Fallon? The worst place on the internet? Twitter? (laughs) TikTok. TikTok. Close. You know, it's a T social media. You guys, I have a whole season coming up about the terribleness of TikTok. I'm so excited. I'm really excited. So get ready for that. We've got nipples. We've got TikTok. We're switching it up. So fucking it's late. We have to go to bed. We love you guys. Good night and good luck. Bum, 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 That's fucked up. up. Oh, God, I'm so fucked up. Can't you see? Bum, it's bum, just bum, really bum, bum, fucked. Bum, bum, That's fucked up. up.